So I'm Judy Clem. I'm with the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. Welcome, everyone. Um, I just want to share a little bit about the conservatory and the Friends, and then we'll introduce Emily, our speaker this evening. So the Oak Park Conservatory was co completed in 1929. It's over 90 years old and is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Pretty impressive. It's free to the public and draws over 50,000 visitors annually. And this um, beautiful conservatory, if you haven't been there, offers a rich atmosphere of flora and um, it extends throughout three indoor conservatory showrooms as well as two outdoor gardens housing a botanic collection of more than 3000 plants. The Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory offers a wide range of programs focusing on enriching the visitor experience at the conservatory. So from volunteering, educational and recreational programs and now virtual programming. Um, there's something for everyone year round. So we've got members. Oh, let me see if I can advance this and you can see we've got over 500 members. Um, I'm putting up some of the member benefits so you can see um, the, the various things you can take advantage of as a member with the friends. And um, we have a wonderful um, community of volunteers, which um, my colleague Nancy Silver manages. And um, we have amazing donors that make our work possible. So we'd love for you to join us. Tonight, we are <laughs> delighted to have Emily Pastor. Um, our, uh, she's a local cookbook author and food blogger. And tonight she will share five ways to preserve your garden harvest. Emily is the author of three cookbooks. The first is Food Swap, Specialty Recipes for Bartering, Sharing, and Giving. The second one is The Joys of Jewish Preserving. And last year's bestseller is Epic Air Fryer. She's a writer and photographer behind the website West of the Loop. And it has been called the, a family food blog to savor. As the founder of the Chicago Food Swap, a community event where handmade foods are bartered and exchanged. Emily is a leader in the national food swap movement. So I welcome Emily Pastor to our program. I'm gonna um, ask you to share your screen. There's Emily. Hi. Hi, thank you for that lovely introduction. Sure. Okay, now I'm gonna share my screen. Yep. And whoops, which is not on the first slide. Okay. Okay. Um, everything good, you guys? You can see me and you can see the slides and you can yep. hear me? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, well, thanks, um, Judy, so much and Nancy for inviting me tonight. As I was saying, it's I speak and talk all over the Chicago area. Um, and uh, right now, of course, I'm just doing it all from the comfort of my kitchen, but <laughs> um, it is really, really nice to do something for the local community and see some familiar faces. So I was really flattered um, to be asked to talk to you all tonight. Um, so obviously the Oak Park Conservatory is really um, focused on things like sustainability and also gardening and plant life in our community and um so i'm going to talk to you guys about something which i think is very closely adjacent to gardening um which is how to preserve the seasonal harvest and this is going to i think be applicable applicable and useful whether you're a gardener yourself like judy is a gardener and um, my friends Kelly and Gary who were I saw in there great great gardeners I'm not I only grow herbs but you know one of the greatest things about Oak Park is our beloved farmers market which they've managed to find a way to do this year which is making me incredibly happy so even if you're not a gardener if you're a big farmers market shopper if you're a CSA um, person and um, Nancy and I were talking about CSAs earlier because she's involved with one um, you know, if you, this time of year, whether, wherever you're getting your local and your seasonal produce from, whether it's your backyard or pick your own farm or a CSA or the farmer's market, this is absolutely like the golden time um, for local seasonal produce. And um, we all know that, you know, it's not going to last and winter's going to be here soon and we're going to be stuck with blueberries that are flown in from Chile or gosh only knows where. So what can we do to preserve the harvest right now when it's at its peak and try to eat a little bit more seasonally, a little bit more locally all year round. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, 
So uh, Judy gave me such a nice introduction and I really appreciate it, but it's just a little bit about me. Um, that's like the cover of my first book, Food Swap. Um, on social, you can always find me pretty much at West of the Loop um, everywhere. My, that's the title of my blog. And I love saying it to an Oak Park crowd because you guys get the little joke. Um, and that's a copy of my, uh, the cover of my second book, The Joys of Jewish Preserving. So if you're interested in canning and fermentation, there's a lot of recipes um, in that book specifically on those topics. Um, so let's take a step back first before we get into the nitty gritty of like how and just talk about why. Because I think as most of us probably realize, there was a time um, until quite recently really in human history where preserving food beyond the growing season was a matter of life and death. This was a time before refrigeration, um, before you know cargo transport, when you could get um, blueberries flown in from Chile in January. Um, and so if people were going, if people, particularly people in harsher climates, like say our climate, if they were going to survive that winter, they were going to have to be able to preserve some of their produce over that long winter. Um, that's obviously not the case now. Um, you can get pretty much anything you want all year round. Um, it may, you know, it may, the blueberries from Chile don't taste as good as the blueberries from Michigan right now, which um, I don't know about you guys, but we buy these like five pound boxes of blueberries at the farmer's market on Saturdays and they're gone by next Saturday. My family just eats them like crazy. So how can you argue with that? It's a superfood. Um, so why do we want to preserve food? First of all, some of it will be just touched on a moment ago. Maybe you have too much. You're a gardener. You're getting a CSA box. You tend to overbuy at the farmer's market. That's me. Um, and so you're, you know, you're, the week is going on and you're rapidly watching these fruit and vegetables that you maybe spent a lot of money on or grew yourself and they're, they're starting to get a little bit long in the tooth and you're panicking, what are we going to do? So that's a great moment to have some of these techniques that we're talking, going to talk about tonight. If you've got them in your back pocket, it's a great way to, um, you know, preserve some of that food, prevent food waste which we know is an environmental problem, um, as well as just sort of being a shame. Um, so some of these techniques are gonna help you when you are just drowning in fresh produce. Um, another reason, touched on a minute ago, environmental reasons, we wanna avoid food waste, we wanna eat more locally, maybe we wanna eat more seasonally. Um, a lot of people who come to me looking to learn how to preserve and can, sometimes they've got dietary issues, a, an allergy, an intolerance, um, and a lot of foods on the market today, commercial foods may have a lot of things in them that they're trying to avoid. So they wanna be starting to making a lot more of their own um, like pantry type staples from scratch. So that's another possible reason um, that people might want to do their own preserving, make their own pickles and jams and um, you know, salt, condiments and whatnot. Lastly, it's just fun for those of you out there who are already canning and fermenting. Um, it's, you know, you can make things that are really delicious. You can make things that are hard to find on the market. I've talked to people who um, have a very, you know, specific nostalgic memory of a grandmother or an aunt or, you know, beloved family member who made apple jelly or watermelon rind pickles, and they can't even find something like that on the market today. So they're really hoping to make it themselves. Um, homemade preserves make beautiful gifts. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we might want to do this. Um, fermented foods, which I'm going to be talking about a little bit later, very, very healthy um, for us. So that's another thing. They've become a bit trendy lately, which I think is funny because it's such an ancient technique. Um, but people are interested in some of those health benefits. So these are all the reasons why we might want to preserve food, even though it's not really strictly a matter of necessity for us. Um, Okay, I'm trying to figure out. Oh, good. I, I guess I figured out how to advance the slides. Okay, um, so that I'm going to be touching on five methods tonight. Um, some much more in depth than others. Some are just going to be a few minutes and, and others I'm going to really try to get into a bit more uh, in depth. So we're going to be talking about canning. And when we talk about canning, there are two kinds. There's ca pressure canning and water bath canning. Obviously, I'm going to demystify that. Uh, we're going to be talking about fermentation. We're going to be talking about freezing, which is always your first line of defense. Uh, we're going to touch on dehydration and also um, root cellaring and cold storage. Um, so those are those are the five methods 
in the title. Okay, let's start with freezing because as I say, it's sort of like what I like to call our first line of defense. Um, if you are not, if you think some of these other methods that I'm gonna be talking about later are a bit too involved, maybe a bit intimidating, though I hope I'm going to make them sound less intimidating, um, freezing is always a great just you know, starting place when you are find yourself drowning in tomatoes, um, berries, zucchini, even things like that. Um, depending on what you're working with, you may want to freeze certain fruits and vegetables raw. Some are better to cook and then freeze. Um, you do always want to be careful, um, making sure you're freezing things the right way. And as an example, berries are something that freeze very well. But if you put put a whole bunch of berries into a Ziploc, you know, gallon freezer bag and throw them in the, fr uh, the freezer, that's not going to go well. Because what's going to happen is the ones on the bottom, you throw, you've, you've put everything in this bag while they're still soft, the ones on the top are going to crush the ones on the bottom. And so that's going, you're going to end up with like kind of a mess. So for example, berries, you want to get a cookie sheet or a sheet tray, something that will fit in your freezer. Side note, when we redid our kitchen two years ago, I literally went to apt with a flick half sheet tray to make sure it was gonna fit into every freezer I want is considering buying. <laughs> That's a true story. Um, so take, spread your berries out in a single layer on a sheet pan, stick it in your freezer. Once they are hard, then you can go ahead and pack them into that freezer safe um, container or bag because they won't crush one another because they've already frozen. So things like that, really helpful to know in terms of making sure you get the most out of your frozen um, products. Um, speaking of which, once something's been frozen, it's never going to obviously be quite the same as it was fresh. And if you are thinking about, again, going back to the example of freezing berries, you know, one of the great pleasures of this moment in the season is eating, you know, the beautiful berries that we get at the farmer's market or maybe from your own bushes or pick your own farm, just eating them, you know, out of hand. Um, once you've frozen berries, they're not going to be good to eat out of hand. However, they're still going to be excellent for many, many uses, including baking. So all those pies and cobblers and, you know, things that we like to bake this time of year, those are frozen fruit will absolutely work for that. Um, they're good for making sauces. Um, they're great for your morning smoothie. Um, so it's all about knowing if you've made the decision to freeze something, just know in your head, okay, how am I going to use this when the time comes? Um, because I'm not going to probably be able to enjoy it just eat um, to be eaten that way. Um, I would say some exceptions might be things like corn, um, peas, we're teeny bit past the um, shelling pea season, but it, we're in the middle of corn season. Corn freezes very, very well. And then again, it's not like you're going to eat it like you would eat corn on the cob, but it's going to go really, really well in your corn chowders and maybe in some of your um, dishes that incorporate corn. Um, I made a Cajun dish, I was telling Judy, um, for dinner tonight that had corn and it's called mock shoe and it's like corn and peppers and celery all chopped up, a little bit Cajun. It was absolutely delicious. So frozen corn would have worked beautifully in that dish, for example. Um, what are the pros and the pros I think we've talked about? It's a very um, straightforward, simple method, no cooking required, usually no expertise, no special equipment other than a freezer. In terms of cons, we just touched on one of them, which is once something's been frozen, you're not going to necessarily be able to use it in the same way again. The other issue for a lot of us is freezer space. Um, some people have the big chest freezers. That's very cool if you do. Um, I think if you do, probably your issue is going to now be organization, making sure you haven't like left that corn in there for five years. Um, but for the rest of us, freezer space can start to be a problem, which is why some of these other methods that we're going to talk about later that um, allow you to preserve things in a manner that's shelf stable can sometimes come in handy. But your freezer is always your good friend. If um, this is less relevant than than in most summers, but I always say to people, if you're about to go on vacation and you still have a full fridge, somehow, um, you know, the freezer is a great is a great tool for that. Um, and lots of different um, things can be frozen. I actually have a handout when I'm giving this talk in person, I give out a handout of what I call my freezer cheat sheet. And we can talk about um, maybe having a, a way from um, 
me or Judy to email all of you guys that later on. And I go through a lot of the common produce and just the way to freeze them. Um, so we can talk about maybe making sure you guys all get a copy of that. Um, so that's freezing. Let's move on to root cellaring and cold storage. Um, this may be a little bit unfamiliar to some of you. I always think of it as like, um, do you guys remember in the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, um, not the show, the books, um, in the very first one, when they're in Wisconsin, there's like a picture of Laura and her sister and they're in the attic and they're like sitting on big pumpkins and there's like things of onions like hanging from the ceiling. That was basically cold storage or root cellaring. There are certain crops that people winter over. So they're fall crops, they tend to be really hardy and they can be stored and wintered over until the following spring. Um, and, you know, people in this in this very area where we all live were doing this, you know, for um, a very long time before they could have refrigeration um, and freezers and all of that stuff. Um, and I often say to people as an example of this, if you know when the farmer's market opens in May and, you know, you're there like Memorial Day weekend or what have you, and there's farmers there with apples, you guys know those are last year's apples, right? There's no apples that are coming ripe in May. Those are apples from last year that they have wintered over. And I don't say that as a criticism. I think that's completely appropriate. And if you're craving apples, terrific. Um, but that's just an example of a crop that's been wintered over. Um, you guys probably can even imagine the kind of crops that do really well in this, uh, for this technique, the, your root vegetables, your winter squashes, um, again, apples, your alliums, and the allium is the word that sort of covers the family of like garlic, onion, leeks, shallots, they're all alliums. Um, they do very well as well. Potatoes, uh, sweet potatoes, those kinds of things. Um, this, you can, we can do this here until really the first sort of like hard, hard freeze. Um, maybe that it's in December or January, you can keep things in um, if you've got a, you know, unheated part of your basement or a garage or a shed, um, as long as you're keeping things protected from animals, um, you can be storing some of these crops in those places. Um, you can also, obviously, if you have fridge space, perhaps that second fridge that's in the garage or in the basement. Um, as an example, at the, the very last day of the farmer's market, and you guys, I think, are probably already being able to tell how much I truly love the Oak Park farmer's market. Um, on the last day of the farmer's market in October, I buy just an insane amount of apples, like 20 pounds or something of apples, like I can barely get out of there. And I keep them in, I have an extra fridge in the basement and I will keep them in there and they will last me probably through the end of the year um, because I just love, love, love the variety of apples that we get at the farmer's market that you just can't get at the supermarket. Um, so things like that, um, you know, they can, do, you can really, if you really like to eat seasonally, um, you know, do stock up at that last farmer's market or if your CSA continues into the fall, some of these things like parsnips, turnips, celery root, um, cabbages, they're going to last you um, a good long while, again, in that fridge, uh, extra fridge. Other things that do well in, um, don't need to be refrigerated, but need cool temps um, and could be possibly stored in that garage or that basement. Um, are things like the garlics, the onions, the shallots, potatoes, um, your pumpkins, and your other winter squashes. Um, sometimes people who live in a much more rural environment than us actually have a proper root cellar that they might dig in their property and they can control the humidity and stuff. That's a little intense um, for most of us here. But if you were living a more homesteady type lifestyle, that might be something you would consider. Um, so let's talk about dehydration for a minute. This is a technique that probably most of us are familiar with, things like jerkies, fruit roll-ups, dried um, fruits that, you know, you might use for cooking or baking. Um, these are all obviously things that have been dehydrated. Um, the dry air uh, removes all of the moisture from the food. Once the moisture is gone, um, the food will not spoil because that's sort of the part of the food that was spoiling was the, the moisture. Um, Dehydration is a great technique. If you have a lot of something and you want to get down to a little bit of something, dehydration is your friend. Tomatoes are a classic example. If there's that moment when your garden tomatoes are like just overflowing and you're literally giving them to strangers, which in this current climate may not go over quite as well as it normally does, but feel free to bring them to me. Um, I have no, <laughs> I'm not squeamish. Um, 
so, you know, oven drying tomatoes is a great way from going, you know, from I have a mass of creative tomatoes and all of a sudden, wait, I have a teeny little jar of tomatoes. Um, so dehydration is great for that. Um, it can really concentrate flavors. So that's really lovely. Um, you know, you don't have to add sugar. Um, these, so it's really, it can be a really nice technique. Obviously somewhat limited in terms of the uses once something's been dehydrated. Um, you know, you, some things can be reconstituted like mushrooms um, and some things, you know, once they're dried, you're gonna sort of eat them like that, like the fruit roll up that is pictured here. Um, you know, you can absolutely dehydrate some of those berries that we were talking about or other fruits. Um, they work really well. This is something that a lot of people, a lot of us have herbs, even people who are bad gardeners like me, maybe can grow herbs. This is a really nice um, technique for your herbs. And obviously we can go to the store and buy dried herbs. Um, but to, I'm going to be completely honest with you guys. I think the dried herbs at the supermarket taste like sawdust. I don't think they, with a few exceptions, don't think they have a ton of flavor. Your own homegrown herbs that you dry and use pretty promptly are going to have tons more flavor. Um, rosemary is one that's great for this, for example. Um, the hardier um, herbs take very, very well to this technique. Um, you know, you just want to hang, you can, it's like very old fashioned. You can hang them upside down in a well ventilated area so that the air is circulating and then you can dry your herbs like that um, mint too really lovely to do that way um, obviously if you're going to be dehydrating things beyond that beyond herbs you there's a couple of things you can do in terms of equipment obviously you can buy a dehydrator there's lots and lots of ones on the market some of them are not particularly expensive um, I think it's a great thing to buy secondhand because people sometimes buy them and then realize they're not really going to use them so you can look um, at Goodwill or other places um, but it is possible to use your oven um, to do some dehydrating projects, um, you know, on its very lowest setting. Um, the, it will take a long time. I mean, we're talking maybe like an overnight or an all day type of thing. Um, I don't own a dehydrator myself and I did make those fruit roll ups that are in the picture and I just used my oven. But it's, you know, it was a matter of many, many hours of this, few, this uh, fruit puree that I had spread very thin on a baking sheet and had put in a very low, like 150 degree oven. Um, so just something to think about if you think this is, you know, again, if you're a gardener, if you're a big CSA person, you're getting a lot of fruit, you think this is something you might want to um, do more frequently, you might think about investing in a dehydrator. Um, so let's, I'm, now we're going to go to fermentation and canning, both of which um, I'm going to touch on in a bit more um, detail because these are the practices that I think are the most useful um, for home cooks and gardeners, um, the most kind of variety in terms of what you can make and do. Um, and also sometimes these are the, the techniques that people want to be starting to do and maybe feel a teeny bit intimidated about. So let's talk about fermentation, which is an absolute um, favorite topic of mine. So fermentation, again, taking a little bit of a step back, it's an ancient, ancient technique. Um, and the history of it is fascinating and I could do an hour on that and I'm not going to. But um, basically this is a technique that originates in China centuries, if not millennia, millennia ago. Um, and it comes to the West uh, across the Silk Road um, carried by traders. And we think it hits Eastern Europe you know, what we today would call like Russia, Ukraine, Poland, um, the areas where actually a lot of people in um, the Chicago area where our ancestors are from. Um, we think it hits there late Middle Ages, maybe early Renaissance. And this is a life changing revolutionary technique for these people, because basically all you need to preserve um, vegetables, mostly vegetables through the technique of fermentation, the only thing you need is salt. And salt is something that every person would have had access to, whether they're the lowliest peasant in, you know, like Russia or Ukraine, they're going to have access to salt because salt is something that everybody needs to live. Um, there's actually a fascinating book on the history of salt called Salt by Mark Kurlansky, and I highly, highly recommend it. It is... Um, Salt is one of those things that, you know, people need to live and as a result has been... Um, for, for as long as there have been people, there have been ways of acquiring salt. But anyway, that is a digression. So fermentation, very accessible technique, even to peasants, because again, the only thing you need is salt. Um, 
And so I, I think it's really important if we kind of try to imagine people in late Middle Ages, early Renaissance, you know, places like Russia, Poland, Ukraine, harsh climates, short growing seasons. Um, and all of a sudden they learn this technique by which they can take the, those hardy crops that they're growing, cabbage, beets, carrots, cucumbers, and they can keep them to, over the winter into the next growing season. Um, and not, and this is an incredibly, you know, healthy technique because not only are you starting with raw vegetables, which right, which are at their peak of nutrition, but actually, as we now know, the fermentation process actually makes these products even healthier because the process, the fermentation process, one makes some of the vitamins that are in those vegetables, like B and C vitamins, easier for our bodies to absorb the, those nutrients. Number one, and number two, um, we now know that. Fermented foods contain probiotics that support gut health, immune health, and other things. So we can only imagine how much this must have changed the lives of people when they start to learn this technique. The other thing is fermented foods really are very flavorful. They've got that tangy, like puckery taste to them, like a you know a delicious pickle or sauerkraut. Um, and I always sort of imagine that these peasants in the, you know in like medieval Russia probably had a very bland diet in winter of like potatoes and like bread. And so maybe, you know, like a tangy pickle really livened things up. Um, I've been sort of focusing on that European history of fermentation by mentioning like things like pickled beets or sauerkraut, but obviously there's an Eastern history as well. Products like kimchi um, in Japanese and Chinese cuisine, there's so many fermented foods. Um, obviously there's so many fermented foods in the world, things like coffee, chocolate, wine, beer, sourdough bread, yogurt, those are all ferments, um, just of different things. We're specifically today talking about fermented vegetables um, in particular. So how do we do, how, you know, how does fermentation work today? Well, basically, again, what you need is salt. And you can either, um, in the case of sauerkraut, for example, cabbage is a food that has a lot of water in it naturally. So basically to make sauerkraut, all you have to do is like massage salt into cabbage. It's going to draw out the liquid and that will create a brine. Um, but if you're working with something like cucumbers, beets, you're going to then need to make a saltwater brine. And I have some here that I've made. So this is a saltwater brine. Obviously, it just looks like water to you guys. But um, this is a saltwater brine that I made for some fermenting that I was doing. Um, you know, without going, I could do a whole hour on fermentation, and I and I have done. So I don't want to get super bogged down today. But um, obviously, it's really important that you have the correct ratio of salt to water in your brine. These are all things you can find out more online or by looking at good, um, reliable cookbooks, and I can certainly recommend some titles. Um, but it's very important to have that correct ratio of salt to water in your brine because that's how you're going to um, attract the good bacteria that cause the fermentation process to happen. That's basically you're harnessing wild yeast or good, what we call good bacteria that's naturally occurring in the atmosphere. You're bringing it to your ferment through that saltwater brine. The other thing that's happening with that saltwater brine is that saltwater brine creates an anaerobic or oxygen-free environment, which um, oxygen is sort of our spoiler for these purposes. Things degrade or spoil because of oxygen. So in an anaerobic environment, your produce is not going to spoil. That's number one. Number two, the brine has attracted that good bacteria, those you know, lactobacillus probiotics, to that particular product. And they're going to um, start the process of turning the vegetables, natural sugars, into lactic acid. And that's going to um, ferment it and give it that characteristic tangy, pickly taste. Um, how long that takes uh, is, and that's a process that happens obviously not in the refrigerator because that would be too cold. You actually want fermentation to happen between like 65 and 75 degrees. So for most of us, room temp, you know, there's, I'm sure there's a place in your house, a basement, a closet where that's the exact temp you're going to find. How long the fermentation process takes is going to depend a little bit on whether you're on the colder or the warmer side of that um, temperature range. I have brought a ferment um, with me. These are some cucumber pickles, some pickle and cukes that I got at our farmer's market um, a little while ago. And you can see they're just in a glass jar. Um, and I poured a brine over them. They, in terms of flavorings, what they've got inside is some dill heads. 
You can also use dill seeds. They've got garlic because a kosher dill pickle is not a kosher dill pickle without garlic. Um, and some mustard seeds and some peppercorns. So different flavorings go right in there with your vegetables. And this was obviously a clean and sterilized jar. Packed the cucumbers in. I packed my seasonings in, I poured the brine over it. I made sure that my vegetables were submerged in the brine. That's a really key point. Um, we have a little saying that we um, say, which is submerge in brine and all will be fine. Because of course you need that anaerobic oxygen free environment. Um, and as long as the veggies are below the brine and not sticking up out of the brine, they are going to, uh, again, be free from oxygen. And when something is fermenting, it gives off gas, CO2 specifically. So it's really, really important that when you are fermenting at home, you have some way of allowing the gas to escape, but obviously you want to cover your ferments so that, you know, dirt doesn't get in or bugs or whatever. So there's lots of ways to do this. Um, and, um, you know, at the most basic level, you can use um, I'm just looking around for some jars. You can use like, you know, mason jars. This one's kind of small, but quart size or half gallon um, mason jars. You can use those to ferment. You can simply put some cheesecloth or muslin over the top, you know, screw on one of these lids to hold it in place. And that's going to be sufficient for these purposes, right? Because the um, muslin or the cheesecloth is going to protect it, but it's going to allow the gas to escape. Of course, this being America, there are about a gajillion products on the market designed to help people ferment. Um, and you can find most of these online. And also, if you don't care to shop online, home brewing stores are very good for some of these fermentation products. So some of the things you might find, these are simply glass weights. Um, remember, I just said a moment ago, it's really important to submerge your vegetables in the brine. Sometimes they kind of want to pop up. So it's very common to put glass weights on top. Um, of your jar at the top to keep things under the brine. These are a product that's sold on the market. And then there's lots and lots of products that are designed to be put on the top of your ferment to allow that gas to escape, but also to prevent any bad things from getting in. And also sometimes to control the odor, because as you guys can see on the slide, sometimes things when they're fermenting can be smelly. So this, for example, is called a pickle pipe and um, it literally fits um, this is, it fits in a wide mouth mason jar. I'm going to show you guys that. So again, these products are all designed to work with the, you know, common like ball or mason jar. So really handy. So it fits right here on a wide mouth mason jar. You guys can't see this, but there's a teeny, teeny, teeny hole right here in this kind of nipply looking thing, forgive me. Um, and so that is sufficient to allow the CO2 to escape, but keep your ferment nice and protected. You guys probably saw when I held up my pickles, this gizmo here, which is called an airlock. This is another thing. I guess home brewers use them quite a bit. Um, so there's also products on the market that have, um, here's another example. This is also a lid designed for a wide mouth uh, ball jar. And you can see it's got this little hole in it. So you can use one of these airlocks and simply put it in the hole and screw that onto your quart size or half gallon size mason jar. This also does a really good job of controlling the odor. And I'm gonna be honest with you, like stuff smells when it's fermenting. Like in your, if you're doing it in the closet or the basement, your family might complain. Um, why does the basement smell like feet? I mean, it could be their feet, but um, it could also be your ferments. So these types of products are really good for um, controlling the odor as well. Now, I don't know how well you guys can see this, but do you remember I held up the brine and the brine, this jar of brine just looks like clear water. It's a salt water. It's very salty, trust me, if you were to try it, but it looks clear, right? And these pickles, they've been in the basement for, I don't know, maybe a week. I should keep better track. Um, but you can hopefully see that this brine is quite cloudy. That's the sign that fermentation is taking place. As your brine starts to turn cloudy, you might see um, bubbles happening. And also you can always taste your product. Um, and I always tell people if it's, you know, people often ask me, well, how long is it going to take for my, you know, pickles to ferment or my sauerkraut or what have you? It's really going to depend a little bit on your situation on the ground, um, how cold your basement is, how cold your closet is. But a good rule of thumb is, you know, try it, try it after five days, try it after a week. If it's still tasting salty to you, it's not, it's probably not done. Okay. It should have that 
puckery, so, you know, pickly taste, not a salty taste. Um, but after that, it's really up to personal preference. You know, um, using the example of like pickles, like a kosher dill pickle, you guys, we don't have great deli here in Oak Park. We have a great farmer's market, but we don't have great deli. But if you go up north and you get some good deli, um, you know, they, you might get offered a half sour or a full sour pickle. Th that's simply just a question of how long it's fermented. If something's um, if you still like your pickles to taste a teeny bit cucumbery, to be a bit crunchier, to be a brighter green, not that like super army green, that's a half sour. So you might ferment your pickles for less time. I'm, you know, I'm an East Coast girl. Like I'm an old, you know, Jew from the East Coast. So I like full on like deli sour, like, you know, all the way pickles myself. So I just let them ferment for a bit longer. Um, but um, this is a great thing to do at home. You do, as I was trying to sort of explain to you guys, you need very little in the way of specialized equipment. Obviously, there's all these products on the market to help make things easier for you. But at the end of the day, mason jars and cheesecloth that you buy at the Jewel is enough to get you started fermenting. Um, again, I do recommend making sure you check out some reliable recipes. So you make sure you, your um, brine is in that correct zone of um, how salty it needs to be because it won't work if it's too salty or if it's not salty enough. Um, but other than that, it's quite, quite easy to get started fermenting. Um, and I'm sure you guys probably have questions about that specifically, and we are going to absolutely have time for Q&A at the end. So hold on to those because um, I'm happy to talk about fermentation more. But I do want to get on to the question of canning, which is another really popular and really useful method of home food preservation. Um, the, I want to take a step back. Well, not I can't take that step back yet. I'm going to have to take a step forward and then take a step back. Okay, so there's two, as I mentioned at the very beginning, there is two kinds of canning, the water bath canning and pressure canning. Maybe you guys have a memory of a mom or an aunt or an uncle or a dad um, doing the water bath canning, which is if you're imagining a big pot of water, boiling water on the stove and they're making jam and they're putting, you know, jam in the um, jars of jam into that boiling water, that's water bath canning, obviously. Um, pressure canning is a bit, um, it requires specialized equipment, specifically a pressure canner, which is not the same thing as a pressure cooker. So you can't use your Instant Pot um, for pressure canning. That's actually, um, I think they're working on that, but at the moment, pressure cooker is different than a pressure canner. Um, and so that's a bit more specialized. I'm gonna circle back in a minute to what pressure canning is for. But water bath canning, which I think for most of us is what we think of when we think about canning, is a very safe, very easy method um, of home food preservation for high acid foods. And that's the key piece here is that high acid. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I'm not Marie Curie, Emily, how do I know what's high in acid? Fair enough. Um, this is where I say to you, okay, that's why you're going to um, look for tested, safe canning recipes. Because if you're looking in a reliable cookbook, a reliable website, and there's some recipes for jam, for pickles, for chutneys that are designed for water bath canning, they are going to be in that safe acidity zone. Okay, the thing that is important for me to say though at this point is, you know, if you're the kind of person who reads a recipe and is like, great, that's a super great suggestion, but actually I'm going to start changing, you know, 25 things, not a great idea when you're canning, um, particularly in the beginning, because it is important to make sure that things are staying in that safe acidity zone. This is really more important in things like chutneys, where you might have a whole bunch of different ingredients, some of which are going to be high acid and some of which are going to be low acid. So if you're looking at a chutney recipe or a relish recipe and they call for one cup of chopped onions, they really mean one cup of chopped onions because an onion is a low acid food. And so that recipe is going to be carefully calibrated to have enough acid, whether it's you know lemon juice or vinegar or what have you, to account for those other low acid foods. But in general, I got a little bit in the weeds there, but in general, um, we're talking about things like jam, jelly, um, and vinegar pickles. Obviously, we were just talking about fermentation. And I was just throwing the word pickle around a lot um, and holding up my jar of pickles, but those were fermented 
pickles, right? No vinegar at all in that method we were just talking about, right? We just, that's the whole thing about fermentation is you only need salt. What we're talking about now when I say pickles is vinegar pickles. So the kind of thing where you're going to make a brine on the stove and it's going to have vinegar and water and maybe some sugar and maybe and definitely salt and some seasonings and that's going to be poured over your veggies and then that jar of veggies is going to go into a boiling water bath canner. That is similarly pickles. Um, we use that term really, really broadly, but I'm going to try to say for these purposes, vinegar pickles versus like fermented pickles. So these are all examples of things that can be safely water bath canned. Many of the fruits that we like are already pretty high in acid and can safely be canned as jam, jelly, those kinds of things. Um, the vegetables, things like cucumbers, uh, corn, green beans, carrots, these are all low acid foods, okay? But they can be safely canned with the addition of vinegar. Right? So, because the vinegar is bringing the acid in that case. And so then what you end up with is some, you know, vinegar pickles, um, pickle vegetables in that way. Usually most of the jams and jellies are just going to require some lemon juice to bring them into that safe acidity zone. Now, I just want to take a minute, one second here and like just put a pin in this and say something about tomatoes, because local, you know, if you're a gardener, tomatoes is maybe one of the things you're growing and people love to can tomatoes. And um, tomatoes, confusingly, are in a gray zone in terms of acidity. And this is really interesting because people often tell me, well, but my grandmother canned tomatoes and she never added vinegar or, excuse me, she never added acid to them. Right. Interestingly, a couple generations ago, our tomatoes were higher in acid than the tomatoes we grow today. We have been breeding tomatoes to be less acidic. Um, I don't know, maybe we were all getting heartburn, um, but the tomatoes today are not quite acidic enough to be safely water bath canned without the addition of some additional acid. So you can add lemon juice to your tomatoes, you can add citric acid to your tomatoes. Um, I'm happy to talk about that more specifically in the questions because I always, always, always get questions about that. But the key is water bath canning is a very safe method for these high acid foods. And why is this acid thing so important? Well, I always say to people, you know, people joke about, you know, I'm scared to can, I'm worried I'm going to poison my family. What do they mean by that? What they're talking about is botulism, which is sort of the big, the big baddie um, that we're all worried about when we talk about canning. Well, here's the good news. The microorganism that causes botulism cannot exist in a high acid environment, period, end of story. So if you are safely water bath canning, that is to say you are using, you are following recipes, you are only doing this for foods that are in that safe acidity zone, botulism is like off the table as a concern. It shouldn't be even possible, okay? So hopefully that's reassuring to people. And sort of to reinforce that point, the only instances of people getting botulism from home canned foods in kind of recent history were foods that were improperly pressure canned. Okay, people are not getting botulism from jam is what I'm trying to say. Um, and let me, and while I'm on that subject, so pressure canning, which I was alluding to a moment ago, which does require the specialized equipment of a pressure canner, that is the only safe way to preserve low acid foods for shelf stability. And by that, I'm talking about things like vegetables that aren't pickled, that don't have vinegar, so straight up canned corn, canned green beans, but also things like chicken broth or soup or even meat or fish. So this is a technique that people who are hunters, people who are anglers are using, people who maybe have, are like sort of homesteaders or they live off the grid. This is a technique that they are familiar with, that they're using to can the things that they grow or catch or shoot. Um, and it's really, really important that people know what they're doing when they're pressure canning. I will admit to you right now, I've never done it. I don't know how to do it. I'm not super interested in doing it because again, I don't hunt, I'm not a fisher person. So it just isn't super relevant for me. I pr much prefer the things I can make through water bath canning. Um, so let's talk a minute about water bath canning more specifically and how it works. Oh, good. Okay. So. Water bath canning. Again, I think this is probably the technique that most of us are familiar with. Basically, what you do is you are making something that is safe to make this way, such as a jam, such as I've got some beautiful pickled um, 
carrots there on the slide. Um, and so maybe you've got two pots on your stove, say, and one of them is a big canning pot and it's filled with water. I brought my canning pot with me to show you guys tonight. I have a fancy one. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. I, I, and so this is, so you guys see it's got this glass top. It's this giant thing. Nice. This one has a beautiful, it has a dial here, which is going to be hard to see, but that tells me when the water is boiling. Not that I couldn't tell that myself, <laughs> but, but, ha but so great. Okay. Now I'm going to show you the most important thing about your canning pot and this, and it's the rack. Can you guys see that? So this is a rack. It is really, really important when you're canning that your glass jars that you're, which are you know, you're only using glass jars designed for home canning use. We'll talk about that in a minute. Your jars are not sitting directly on the bottom of your pot, which is on the hot stove. Okay, I think we can all guess why they could crack. So what you need to can safely is you need a big pot and it doesn't have to be a big canning pot. Any big stock pot will work with whatever those big pots that like Gentiles use to cook their lobsters in. That's fine. The thing you need that is a rack of some sort, something that's going to elevate your jars off of the bottom of the pot and allow the boiling water to circulate all the way around the jars, top, sides, and bottom. So you can come up with your own version of a big pot with a rack in it. You can use a steamer basket. You can use um, the rack that comes with your Instant Pot. You can even, um, if you guys have seen those silicone trivets that are sometimes like in a blossom shape, that works too. So again, you can certainly go out and buy a canning pot. A canning pot is going to come with a rack. They're not even particularly expensive at the big box stores, but if you don't even want to do that and you have a big pot already, just come up with some way to jerry-rig it so that your jars are not on the bottom. Um, so you've got a pot and it's going to be full of water and you're going to have whatever you're making that day, maybe some beautiful jam, and you're going to have some of your jars that are intended for home canning use. And these are the ball jars, the mason jars that we're all familiar with. They come in a lot of different sizes um, and shapes. So this is a pint jar and this is a half pint jar. I made some apricot jam today, you guys. Um, this is also a half pint jar. Okay, which is to say, right? But my hands are finger all the way, but it's a wide mouth jar. So it's shorter and wider and this one's taller and skinnier, but they are both holding the same amount. These half pint jars are great for jams. Pint jars typical for like a vinegar type pickle. Um, and obviously you can go up, this is a quart jar that has the brine in it. I have a lot of jars. Um, and these are all designed for home canning use. Um, the jars are, can be used over and over again, very sustainable practice. And you know, they will have the ring and they will have the lid. The, these lids, which have a sealing compound on the inside, these are designed for a one time use. They are seal once. And when, and I'm going to talk about how that works in just a sec. Once you break the seal to eat your jam or what have you, that cannot be used again for canning. Certainly it can be used for storage. Um, there are products on the market with reusable lids. Um, if you're concerned about that, the WEC jars um, that have glass lids, there's um, plastic lids uh, by a company called Tatler that are reusable. Um, so if you're even concerned about you know, that amount of waste of the lids, you can find reusable lids. It's just that I give away a lot of jam. And if you give away a jar of jam that has a reusable lid on it, you're never seeing that lid again. So I stick with these um, uh, lids that the ball company makes. And as you might imagine, you can buy boxes of just rings and lids or even just lids because the jars, as I was just mentioning, can be used over and over again. So how does it work? What's the science behind this? Why is it a safe practice? Okay, so what happens is, you know, you make your jam, you make your vinegar pickles, whatever you're making that day that, again, is a high acid food. And you fill up the jar, and it, just side note, make sure your jars are warm when you're putting boiling hot jam or boiling hot brine in them. Don't put that into a cold or room temp jar. Um, I just put my jars in the water at the beginning so that I know they're warm when I need them. Um, but you put your jam or your pickles into your jar you put on the ring and the lid, okay? And um, you don't screw the lid on super tight, by the way. You just put it on just so you feel that resistance. And you pop it into your boiling water bath. Now, what's happening in that boiling water bath is a couple of different things that are important. One, the heat from the boiling water 
It's going to go penetrate all the way to the center of the jar and kill any possible bacteria or baddies. Now remember, botulism, not a concern because we're only doing high acid foods and botulism can't survive in that environment. But there could be other bad guys, bacteria. So the heat from the boiling water is sufficient to kill that. Now, side point, um, canning recipes are going to tell you, different recipes are going to tell you how long your jar needs to be in that boiling water. Maybe it's 10 minutes, maybe it's 15. With tomatoes, it could be as much as 30 or 35 minutes. That's how long it is going to take for the boiling water of the heat to get all the way to the center of the jar. So things that are denser, like maybe a fruit pie filling, it's going to take a bit longer. So be sure your recipe is going to tell you how long it needs to be in that boiling water. But the, A, the heat from the boiling water is going to kill the bacteria. That's thing number one that's going to happen. Now remember, way back when we were talking about fermentation, I said that how oxygen is a spoiler and is our bad guy here because it causes things to spoil and break down. Well, again, we need to make sure there's no oxygen in these jars. So what happens when your jar of jam or pickles is in the boiling water? Flashback to high school chemistry, when things are um, heated up, they expand. So what happens is, is that the oxygen that's in that jar is pushed out. Now, side point, remember I was telling you guys when you fill up your jar with jam or pickles, it's really important not to fill it to the tippy top. You need to leave a little bit of room at the top. We call that headspace because otherwise it's going to overflow. So you've left a little bit of room at the top and in the heat of the boiling water, all the oxygen gets pushed out of that jar. Okay, and then at once you once it's been in the boiling water for a sufficient amount of time to kill all the baddies, you take it out of the water and when things cool down, what happens? They contract. Okay, and so what happens is your product contracts, your lid with that sealing compound seals, creating a vacuum seal. That's when you hear that sealing sound. Okay, and now imagine this jar is like the jar in the picture. Um, this is full of some kind of delicious vegetable pickle, or maybe it's a relish. We've heated it up. It's killed all the bad guys. The oxygen's all pushed out, and now it has a vacuum seal so no oxygen can get in. And this is now a shelf-stable product for up to a year, according to the USDA. So I was telling you guys, I made some apricot jam today. These apricots were kind of sitting in my fridge for a long time. I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit. And this is a nice sealed jar. Do you guys see? Okay, I can literally hold this by the lid. This is vacuum sealed on there. It is, no oxygen can get in, all the oxygen's out. This is shelf stable. I can keep this not in the fridge. In my pantry downstairs, I can ship it across the country to my mom, um, whatever I need to do. But that's a shelf stable product. Um, I was just talked to you guys about equipment in terms of, you know, the canning pot, the rack, we need to make sure we're using the jars and the lids. Other than that, there's only a few things that I think are really helpful. This is a jar lifter. I know everyone thinks it's going to be this way, but it's this way. Um, and this is just super handy dandy because tongs just don't cut it. Um, and then the other thing I really like is a funnel. Um, that's a fancy funnel too. I'm very fancy, you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in terms of, you know, once you've gone out and maybe bought that canning pot, but even then, if you've got stuff in your kitchen that can work for this, what you nearly need to buy is the jars um, and you are good to go with canning. The one thing I just want to emphasize again is it really is important in this instance to be following recipes that have been tested that seem reliable. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that can sometimes seem like a bummer, because maybe you're the kind of cook that likes to experiment, but this is sort of not the moment for experimentation. Um, and the other thing I would say is if you want to experiment a little bit around the margins, so like that apricot jam I made today, you know, I made sure that for the um, amount of apricots I had, I had the correct amount of sugar, um, but maybe the recipe I was looking at wanted me to use, put some ginger in it, and instead I put in cardamom because I'm crazy. Um, that kind of experimentation or playing around that's not going to change the acidity levels, that's going to be fine. So you can always have a little bit of fun there on the margins. Um, but again, tested recipes are going to be key in terms of, you know, making your making feeling comfortable and making sure that you are staying safe. Um, so, so that's I just want to interject. Is, are, yes. are, we, are we wrapping up? Because I would love yeah. to get to some of these questions. And um, if you're, I think that's my last slide, Judy. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Hey. Well, 
there we are. Okay, perfect. We made it. Okay, um, I'm going to have you stop sharing um, for okay. a moment and um, we'll go through some of the questions that are here. I think if we go back to the top of the questions, we'll start from the beginning and we'll um, just start chipping away. So Nancy, help me if I miss something. Um, and first of all, thank you. Um, that was fantastic. You covered a lot of information, but I think we have some people that want to know a little bit um, of course. specific and let's see what we can tackle here. Um, let's see, um, Aliyah, how do we know what freezes better cooked versus raw? Can you address um, what about freezing you would for sure cook and things that you would um, say are okay for raw? Yeah, and you know, the thing I would, Judy, hopefully maybe there's a way we can find to get people my little handout yes. that I've written up on this topic. Yeah. Um, generally, um, gosh, it's so hard. To me, it's sort of common sense, and I know that's like so unsatisfactory. But um, again, one way to sort of think about it is think about how you're going to use it. Mm -hmm. um, so something like onions, you, you know, you, you can cook onions down into like almost like a confit and freeze that, but you're not going to want to freeze a raw onion. Um, berries freeze great raw. Um, again, things that like, if something's more delicate, like peas, corn, you freeze them raw, but if, and berries, but if something's a little bit like heartier, you're going to want to cook it and then freeze. Mm -hmm. so that would be sort of the, my generalization. Okay. That's tough. Um, and then we'll get that cheat sheet from you. Yeah. Um, okay, The another question about the cold storage. I've never done this, and so I'm very curious about it too because I would like to hoard apples and pears. Um, so you talked about like um, what's a good closed box. Like I, I just, I'm not sure. And then somebody else is also asking, um, you mentioned storing apples, pears, beets in an unheated garage. Does this include a detached garage? So just talk to us a bit about um, the cold storage method. What works for you? Is it a cardboard box? Is it a wooden box? Is it a, a plastic container? So I'm going to freely admit, this is not my big area of expertise. Okay. Um, but basically, there's two kinds of um, products fall into one of two categories, cool storage or cold storage. Okay. So cool storage are, is things that can be preserved in like from 45 to 60 degrees. Um, so those are things that, you know, that's the stuff you're putting in the garage or the unheated part of your basement. These are things that are like the alliums, the potatoes, and maybe the winter squashes. Um, and you want to have a pro like again not my big area of expertise and i'm sure there's probably some good resources out there a you need to protect from critters okay that's number one number two depending on the um specific thing you need to worry a little bit about humidity so like i know potatoes like humidity is an issue um and you need to have some kind of circulation so you're going to have to have a box that's going to protect things from critters but it's going to maybe have holes to allow some kind of air circulation um so i would just say I, I, my guess is there's some pretty good resources out there um online or maybe library books about they're going to be go into that more specifically okay um the kinds of things that need to be in cold storage are the, your apples, um, your pears, and then the, um, the root vegetables, the more like your carrots, celery, root, beets. Um, and that's where you're gonna want that second fridge um, if you've got access to one, um, whether it's like in the garage or in the basement. And those are just products that are just gonna, in that below 45 degree temperature, they're gonna last a good long time, several, several months. Mm -hmm. um, again, you as with anything, you want to humidity is like going to be your enemy. So if it's you know it's better to have it in a mesh bag versus a plastic bag where like it's stuff's building up um, in terms of moisture. Um, and the other thing is, and this is complicated, but the fruits, the apples and the pears, give off ethylene gas, uh -huh. and that can cause the vegetables to go ripe. So it's a bit of a catch twenty two. Okay. So priorities. Investigate a little bit more if you're going to do kind of that cool storage. Um, yeah. And then if you have room in one of your um, extra refrigerator space, you can um, definitely try to store some of those fruits. Okay. Um, does the salt water ratio, moving on, change for different foods when you're doing the fermentation? Whoever asked that question, what a great question. I'm super impressed. In general, no. Um, 
it's and um, this is an example. I didn't want to get into the weeds too much with this, but this is an area where I really do recommend um, going out and maybe getting a kitchen scale, which is a product that I generally do recommend. If you're a baker, kitchen scales doing weight measurements versus volume measurements way more accurate. That's why they're always doing it on the Great British Baking Show and in Europe. But again, it's um, same thing with fermentation. A lot of times what you want is a ratio of salt to um, like weight of your vegetables. Um, and usually like 3.5% is a really good ratio. So, um, you know, 3.5% of the weight of your vegetables in salt. Okay. If that makes wow. sense. Um, in terms of brine, um, there are some pretty standard um, things to make it easier. Like, um, uh, this is what I get for doing stuff off the top of my head. But for like a gallon of water, it's maybe like half a cup of salt. Okay. Um, do not quote me on that. I okay. like I need to double check, but it's close to that. Again, there's going to be really good resources for that. Um, the only thing that's a little different is cucumbers. Okay. Is cucumbers are mushier and waterier than a lot of the other things you might ferment. So a cucumber brine would be a little bit, um, is going to be a teeny bit different. Okay. Okay. So then once those foods are fermented, this is my question. I, I just can't remember. How do you store them? How long do they last? Is this- Oh, I can't believe I didn't say that. Or does it go in the fridge and how long does it last? Yeah, I totally should have said that. Uh, fridge. So once your pickle or whatever you're fermenting, like- once these guys are done and they're not done yet, they need to go to the fridge because okay. what's going to happen is if you don't put them somewhere really cold, like a fridge, they're going to keep fermenting Oh, until you, and then you're going to end up with mush. Okay. So when it's to your liking, pop it in the fridge. Okay. And again, I know that's a bit of a problem because maybe fridge space is an issue, but, but unfortunately that's the only answer really. Okay. Um, and so once it's in the refrigerator, it can last for several weeks. Even oh my gosh, longer. longer than that, months. Okay. Months, okay. months. Yeah. I try to make I mean, enough. I love these pickles so much. I try to make enough, like now, to last me to next summer. Okay. Wow. Okay. I'll have to Never swap. Worked. I'll have to swap you some. Um, okay. So the thank you for the information about the acidity and the tomatoes. And Janet um, chimed in with a nice comment about um, if you use a recipe prior to 1985. Um, it probably didn't have the correction for the acidity. So I appreciate um, that comment there. Um, okay, so Irene asked a good question about canning that I was going to answer, but I really want you to answer this question. Does the boiling water bath go over the top of the jar? Absolutely, so, yes. Yeah, so you're submerging your, your jars of jam into this water bath about four inches under the water. Yeah, the key, the, the, the image that you wanna have in your head is the boiling water needs to circulate all the way around the jar. The jar needs to be surrounded by boiling water. That's one of the reasons we elevate our jars. Obviously we elevate our jars in part because we're worried about them cracking. But the other reason is we really do want boiling water underneath the jar as well as on the side, as well as on top. So yeah, cover your, your jars with a couple, a few inches okay. of the boiling water. Oh, Nancy, did I miss anything? I'm gonna, you guys can all unmute if you want. Um, I can maybe, I can maybe do it. I don't know if I can do it. Let me see. Um, allow participants to unmute themselves. That was, I believe, the last of our questions. And I, you covered there was a one, lot. There was one other question oh, yeah. um, from our, our beloved Patty. Oh, yeah. She had a question about um, heirloom tomatoes. Are those also not acidic enough? Not. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So just to get onto that point, just to make a tiny bit of a finer point on it, this really bums people out for some reason. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> people don't want to add lemon juice to their tomatoes. I totally get that. But the other solution is go to that health food store that's on North Avenue. That's kind of like taking like a time warp back to the seventies. I kind of love that place. And, um, they'll sell you citric acid. Citric acid is nothing more than vitamin C. You guys, some, and some people call it sour salt. Um, it used to be, a, it used to be, people used to use it as a seasoning. You can add that to your tomatoes and it's not going to change the taste. It really isn't, but it will bump up the acidity level. So I, I think you can also get that at the Sugar Beet Co-op. So places oh, like that, 
um, in Oak Park, um, you can actually purchase that. They're real yeah. supportive of canning. Yes, they've got great stuff at Sugar Beet. You don't get the like, you know, to throw back in time to the 70s as much, but, <laughs> but um, love the Sugar Beet. The spirit is there for sure. So first of all, let me thank you for taking your time, Emily, to share your knowledge and really give us kind of this overview. And now I'm thinking, what am I going to do with all these things coming out of my garden and um, I'm in this great fruit CSA um, with Nancy and we've got blueberries coming out of our ears. So um, I'm really appreciative of understanding better fermentation and um, definitely a, a canning fan and um, trying to plan what I'm going to try um, pickling next. But I really appreciate you um, being our guest this evening and um, to all of our friends on this program. I hope you enjoyed it.